that we talk about highs and lows. They're a part of life. In fact, uh, at my dinner table, uh, as uh, my kids were growing up and in high school, we would end most of our days uh, talking about our highs and lows. Anybody do that at their dinner table? Yep. So we're going to do that right now just to kind of warm us up. Uh, if you're sitting next to someone you feel like you can talk to, tell them what yesterday's high and low was. You've only got 20 seconds. Make it fast. No stories. Go. Hurry up. Some of you are not even doing it. Come on, hurry up. Okay, the other person should be going now. All right. Okay, here's mine. You ready? Eleanor went to see our dad uh, in Kentucky, so I'm alone. Yesterday, I had the longest and best nap that I've had in months. It was glorious. All right? Thank you. No, you can, you can rejoice with me. I was. Uh, so that was my high. You know what my low was? Waking up from that nap, that was the worst. Why couldn't it just keep going? I wanted willy, uh, wee willy winkle stuff. All right, uh, uh, we are talking about highs and lows, and we are studying a prophet in our Bibles in uh, 1 Kings uh, uh, chapter 19 today, if you want to go there with me, named Elijah. Elijah, just a little itty bit of our Bible, right? Just, just very few pages, uh, but has incredible highs in his story, right? Starts with his confrontation of the king of Israel at the time, a guy named Ahab. He had been wicked and it allowed his uh, you know, uh, bride uh, Jezebel to lead his nation into the worship of a false god named Baal or Baal. And, uh, uh, and so uh, Elijah comes just out of nowhere and confronts Ahab, says it's not gonna rain. It doesn't rain for three and a half years and then God provides for Elijah uh, food from ravens and food from a widow in enemy territory, a place called Zarephath, up where Baal is worshiped. Um, he uses Elijah to raise a young child back to life and return him to uh, the widow mother that uh, uh, he was living with there in Zarephath. He, he, t- he leads Elijah to the, to the mountains of Carmel and there he shows down or shows up and shows off uh, his power as Elijah defeats the 400 prophets of Baal. Uh, he, he finishes the drought. Elijah's instrumental in that. His prayers bring about the end uh, of this long uh, period of, of rainlessness. And then my favorite part of the story, Elijah runs in celebration from where he is to a place called Jezreel, and he beats the, tro- uh, the, the, the king's chariot and horses. That's going. Everybody knows that's going, right, in a 15-mile race. It's my favorite part of the story. Lots of highs. Everybody reading those highs with me? They're just amazing miracle stories. Uh, but today he's going to experience low. It's fitting that we're doing on, on a day that we celebrate seniors because they're experiencing one of life's great highs to this point, the graduation from high school. It's all cards and cakes, and hopefully there's big checks in those cards and uh, you know balloons and confetti and celebration. Um, but uh, no one needs to tell them that it's not always like this. The challenges await. Highs and lows are a part of life's experience. Um, I know that, uh, that that occurs here in our church body because last week, as Tom preached, did an amazing job, he encouraged many of you to put prayer requests on the, on the crosses as we finished at our service last week. 355 of you did. It's by far the most prayer cards we've ever had. And so our, our staff has had a great time this week just kind of divvying those up and responding to those things that we could. If you left your name, we tried to talk to you. Um, but this is my stack, okay? Prayed over them all week. Uh, and anybody want to guess what the source material of these prayer cards are? Hurts, pains, disappointments, discouragements. Yeah, there's just too many to, to number. Um, and so we all greet each other at the doors. Hi, have a nice day. Great to have you. God bless you. And, and then we go and we wrestle with the things that are in these cards. I'm praying for you guys. Uh, but we all know that life has... Uh, Great highs, Uh, blessings that we don't deserve, amen? But life has its fair share of devastating, difficult lows. Let's read about uh, Elijah's uh, little trough here, his his low as it uh, comes in his story. Look at uh, 
Chapter 19, verse one, it says, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. So King Ahab was there. He's referring to the, to the showdown of the prophets of Baal versus uh, you know, the prophet of, of God, Elijah. It was 400 to one, right? And, and Elijah won. If you're not familiar with the story, God set his sacrifice on fire and burned everything that was a part of it. Uh, and so uh, the end of that story uh, is basically the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the putting to the sword of all of the prophets of Baal, the children of Israel, uh, were complicit in the execution of these prophets. And so Ahab comes back to his Baal-worshiping wife, Jezebel. Her name means uh, all hail the prince Baal. Uh, and, and so tells uh, his wife what's going on, says uh, what Elijah had done. Note that Ahab does not say what God had done. And uh, how he killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel, verse 2, uh, decides to do something about that. So can you picture, you know, uh, it's not graduation, but maybe like some kind of prophet graduation, right? Like Elijah's been the victor and he's getting all the pats on the back and everybody's siding with him as they head back towards God there in Israel and away from Baal. Um, and, and Jezebel hears the news and she, it's the first text ever in history. She texts Elijah, it's not really a text anyway, but she sends a messenger and, uh, and says this, on the down low, uh, in the midst of the celebration, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as, as the, uh, the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. What she's saying, if you're not dead like all of my prophet friends, by this time tomorrow, may I be dead. It's a death threat. Hmm. How would Elijah handle this latest challenge? If his record's any indicator, well, would be my answer. Like every time something has come up, Elijah has risen by the grace of God and in his strength to whatever he was facing, right? Whether it was confronting the most powerful man in his kingdom or uh, trusting him to feed him by birds, uh, you know, to raising a, a child from, from death. I mean, just all these things, fighting off prophets of a false deity. Uh, he had just aces, man, just, you know, was, was the, uh, you know, the, uh, the valedictorian of his prophet class. But in this one, something's different. In this one, he tucks tail and he runs. So the verse three that Elijah was afraid. So afraid that he ran for his life and he came to a place called Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and it's there that he left his servant. Just so we can kind of put this in context, um, he basically ran from here to like uh, Fort Myers. Is, is that 100 miles? I should have checked before I said that. But uh, it's 100 miles from where he was up here in the northern part of, of the nation of, of, of Israel uh, down to the southern tip of the nation of Judah. Israel's split into two now. It's Israel and Judah. And he runs straight out of his country and almost to the end of the other country that used to be his country. It's 100 miles. No Uber, Right? You can't get on Spirit Airlines, and he's prob probably grateful. But uh, uh, that was horrible. Sorry, Spirit Airlines employees. Uh, but he, he's he's gone, faced with the prospect of death. His fear overrides his faith. And I'm so grateful that that never happens with any of us in here. When life's lows comes, that you know fear wells up in us to the point that we lose faith in God and what He can do. Isn't it great that none of us struggle with this? Isn't that awesome? Is anybody picking up my sarcasm as I spew it at you? Yeah. We can all relate to Elijah, no matter how many victories, no matter how many highs. Um, when life hits its lows, it's hard to be a hero of God and, and, and easy to be a zero with God. Hmm. Now, that word there where it says that he was afraid is, is actually kind of a, uh, a liberty taken by English translators just so that we can understand what it was being said there. The actual word is, uh, I gotta make sure I say the Hebrew somewhat right. It's ra ha. It's like breathing sounds. And ra ha means basically saw. And so if you read the older translations in the English, it says that Elijah saw and ran. And I thought this week as I was thinking about this, um, our eyes can mess with us, can't they? Like depending on what they're focused on, it determines our reactions. Like if our folk, eyes are focused on God and who he is and what we know about him and believe about him, then faith is easier. I won't say it's easy, but it's easier, right? But if our eyes go off of him onto the circumstances of our situation, then faith is just so much harder, almost impossible. It reminds me of the story of when uh, Peter is walking on water with Jesus in the Gospels, right? 
and, and it's fine. They're dancing on the waves. And then all of a sudden, it tells us that his eyes see the storm. And when his eyes see the storm, what happens? He sinks. And it's all in what he saw. Paul told the Corinthians in his second letter to them in our Bibles that we who follow God, we walk by faith and not by sight. Crucial. And not something that Elijah was able to do in this particular event. So he's running. He gets to Beersheba, he drops his uh, servant off, and then he himself, it says in verse four, uh, went another's day journey, I don't know how far that was, uh, but he went another's day journey further south into the wilderness. The wilderness is, is Old Testament speak for the desert. So no food, no 7-Elevens to stop off at and get a monster, right? He's just heading into destitution further and further alone until he finally comes uh, to a place uh, that had a broom tree. A broom tree had big you know, uh, uh, leaves and, and, and would provide shade in the desert. And he, he sat down and he asked God, this is his prayer. He hasn't talked to him yet, but this is his first uh, recorded prayer in this situation. Uh, he doesn't ask God for uh, you know, help. He just prays this. He says, God, enough. Anybody prayed that prayer? God, enough. I've had it. Now, oh Lord, take away my life. Go ahead, beat the queen to it. She's gonna kill me, and, and, and you might as well just do this. Take away my life, because I'm no better than my father's. I read all week, and I can't get a straight answer on what he was meaning when he said, I'm no better than my father's. The best I came up with was, uh, he understands his frailty, like all of the, the Israeli leaders before him. Uh, I know I'm going to die. I'm probably going to die serving you. Uh, Just you do it. And don't let this evil, uh, false God-worshipping queen be the ones who ends me. This is his prayer. Anybody grateful that God doesn't answer all of our prayers? Anybody ever prayed something kind of extreme and silly like this? You know, and and it's out of your desperation and emotion. I get it. But God, you know, uh, is discerning, doesn't answer all of our prayers. But it does beg the question, what, what makes Elijah and us, when we find these lows, what makes Elijah in this particular situation crater? A couple things, maybe. Now, the first one is that uh, the higher your expectations are, often the, the, the lower or the deeper uh, you feel the disappointment that comes when they aren't realized. Like, we don't have this in, in our record, but, but I can assume that Elijah, after years, like three and a half years of just faithfully serving God and finally triumphing over these prophets of Baal, he's so excited, so elated, God, by his spirit, empowers him to beat a chariot in a foot race. I mean, he is like spiked, right? All time high, on a heater, like, like none other. And he's probably thinking, good, done, drought's over. Prophets are defeated. I'm, gonna, I'm lining up for a cushy job in the government. I'm probably going to be like Samuel was with all the first kings. I'm just going to be this guy who kind of walks around and, and everybody waits for him for the sacrifice. I mean, it's going to be great. I'm guessing that might have been among his expectations. Instead, he gets a text saying, I'm going to kill you. And he's like, here we go again. Anybody been there? Here we go again. The last doctor's visit showed no cancer. The next doctor's visit, here we go again. The last time you talked to your kid, he had beaten his addiction. The next time you talked to your kid, you're bailing him out of jail. Here we go again. Couple that with what I, uh, I know from experience is just a reality in life. Uh, sometimes there's a cumulative effect to stress. And you could see victory after victory after victory in the stresses of your life, but then that next one comes and you're just like, like Elijah, enough. Enough, God. Thanks for all the good stuff you did back here, but I can't take one more. As a young pastor, I uh, moved here in 2004. I'd never been a a senior pastor before. I had to learn on the fly, right? Um, God blessed us despite me in, in, in amazing ways. But there's, like every job, come on, think of yours, there's disappointments. Uh, the, the first hire I made here was a guy named Tom Eichem, he's worked out okay. <laughs> the second guy that I hired here, 
Um, only lasted a year before he, like the pastor that I replaced, made some unfortunate decisions that greatly risked his marriage and certainly disqualified him uh, from being a, a leader at our church. So I had to accept his resignation and just a, a, like a year after he had been here, stand in front of this body of believers who had just gone through this and say it's happened again. On my watch. Now I didn't do it, but I felt responsible as the leader who had basically brought it about. Uh, that was one of the first things. Uh, just, you know, uh, life continued. One of the first visional pieces that we had was to plan a campus, uh, and we did so successfully down at Riverview High School. And, and people met down there, and, and great things happened as a result of that, but unfortunately we did it in 2007, and in 2008 the economy in our, our region uh, just completely bottomed out. Our giving went down, and we couldn't financially sustain the work down there. Uh, and, and we had to pull it back. And I still wonder about that one. Some of you do, you're like, we do too, Mark. You know, uh, but I still wonder about these kinds of things. Like, Lord, what was that? It was so awesome, and then it wasn't. And shortly after that, uh, I don't know if I've preached this before, uh, but uh, in, in basically six months from there, the cumulative effect of all those first four or five years just hit me in ways. that, I, Like one morning, I couldn't get out of bed. And I didn't for like three days. And Eleanor came up to me, merciful soul that she is, and she said, get out of bed. <laughs> no, uh, well, she did, but, uh, uh, but she also said, hey, Mark, what, I don't understand. And like, I don't either. There hadn't been anything in recent history that had gotten me to feel this way. It was just the, the pile up, right? And I remember that week just looking in the, the, the want ads, and I'm like, Lord, anything else. I mean, I'm not leaving you, but I don't want to do this anymore. How's it going? Still here. Did anybody get what I'm talking about? Yeah. Don't be too hard on the people in the Bible. In fact, be grateful that God reports them and records their struggles. There are struggles, and we can learn from them. And the thing that we need to learn today, uh, first of all, life will always bring us low. Lows are inevitable. Can I get an amen on that? It's an unfortunate amen, but it's true. Okay? So when lows come, we have a choice, basically two choices. We can make a mess of those lows or make the most of those lows. They're coming. You decide how you want to handle them. Now, Elijah, in this story, for our sakes, starts out making a mess and by God's grace moves into making the most. So let's study those things together as we read. Let's, first of all, figure out how to make a mess of life's lows. I don't usually preach this way, but if you, if you want to ruin your life, pay attention. In, a, in, a, in any low, if you want to make a mess, try to fix things yourself. Just get in there, roll your sleeves up, and try to make it all better yourself. That's what Elijah does. In verse 3, it says that Elijah was afraid, and in his fear, he chose to rise up and run, and ran for 100 miles before he took a break to stop. It's the first time in his story that Elijah has done anything uh, except what God had asked him to do. And God asked him to do some pretty scary stuff. But in this situation, for the reasons that we just discussed, Elijah's like, no, I got this. I'm gonna run. Like a sheep, Elijah has gone astray and he has turned to his own way. He has not trusted in the Lord with any part of his heart. And he has leaned all of himself on his own understanding. In all of his ways, he is ignoring God, so God is not able to make his path straight. He leaves Israel proper and gets to the edge of Judah, running for his life from a queen who would have it. I don't know if all the seniors stuck around, but uh, the reason that we're praying for your provision and protection is because the next four years are going to be spiritually harrowing for you. The statistics are alarming. Like it's always been kind of rough. But Barna did a study, Barna, George Barna does this whole statistic thing. He did a study in 2022 that found that Christian kids who go off to college, you may want to guess, seven out of 10 of them get to the end of their college careers either having no faith or little faith in the God that they grew up believing in. Now that should alarm us, but it shouldn't surprise us. 
Like I had three kids and I'm praying for two of them. That's right around 70%. It's hard when the bottom of life falls out to continue to look to God. And everything in us wants to take things into our own hands. But life has taught me that where I don't know, I need to find someone who does. If I'm gonna get out of this mess, I need help. I used to go to this guy, uh, Dennis, I call him OSHA. He's moved away, so I've had to find someone else to help me with my projects. Uh, Steve Hardy works here at our, our church, and uh, he's super knowledgeable, and he's got all the cool tools. Anybody got a friend like that? And so I almost specifically go to Steve first anytime it's getting you know, ready to fix something. Why? Because he knows, and he'll help. We'll get to this as we talk about how to make the most of your messes, how to make the most of your life's lows. But the, the most important thing is to know that you can't and that God can. You want to make a mess of your life? Make a mess of your life's lows? Try to fix them yourself. Second thing you do is you isolate yourself from others. Surefired way to make things worse. Uh, I don't know how this uh, servant gets in the story, but I think it's very pointed that he does. Um, uh, Elijah has this servant, no name. We don't even hear about him until this story, this part of the story. And he, he takes him with him, apparent, all, apparently all the way to Judah, all the way to Beersheba, and then he tells him for whatever reason, we don't know, it's, maybe he's got a family he's got to get back to, but Elijah says, you stay here, and he keeps moving another day's journey into the, into the desert by himself, which is you know a part of the human condition. I can handle this. I need no one else. He's utterly alone. And it's just not going to lead to solution. I was reading this week uh, C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters. Anything you get your hands on from Clive Staples, read, read C.S. He's pretty great. You're going you're gonna to need time. You're going to have to read, you know, read each page a couple times. Uh, but uh, he's just so wise. And he writes these, th- th- this book, Screw Tape Letters. It, it's from the point of view of a, of a master demon who's training an underling demon in how to basically oppress those who follow God. And he writes him a series of letters. In the ninth letter, he's writing to, uh, you know, uh, Wormwood, uh, or screw tape or Wormwood, I can't remember which one's which, but he's writing, ha, and he says, hey, when a, when a Christian gets dis- dismayed, when he's discouraged, when he's low, do everything you can to separate that person from other people who believe in God. Do everything you can to isolate that one who is dismayed. His reasoning basically goes along, you know, to the hunt. If, if we can separate them from the pack, they'll be easier to pick off. But that's what we do in our despondency. Is, uh, we go to our own thinking, our own source, and seek ourselves rather than others who might help. We need our sounding boards. I got interested this week. Uh, I always love finding out where sayings come from. We get these idioms in our language. Does anybody know where sounding board comes from? I'll tell you. It's from the church. In medieval times, before there were sound systems, like the one that's projecting my voice, uh, they would build basically domes or, or shells around the back of a pulpit to amplify and clarify the words of the preacher in these big, huge you know, uh, cathedrals. And that became known as the sounding board. I love that it's what we use to describe another person in our life who brings amplification and clarification to the things that need to happen in our lives. We aren't meant to do this alone. Like iron sharpens iron. So one man or one woman sharpens another man or another woman. If you want to make a a mess of the lows in your life, try to fix them yourself. Forget about God and just go alone. Stay away from people and those who could help you. And the third thing is this, be consumed with the negative in your life. Any Eeyores in here? Schlep rocks. Those are characters and stories who, uh, who are just you know, cursed with seeing uh, the glass not just half empty, but completely empty. That's where uh, Elijah finds himself as he pulls up under this broom tree in verse four. He says, it's enough, Lord. There's nothing good in this situation. Just finish me and let me, de- let me be done. Uh, 
I understand this. Uh, I, I, I meet with my life group right there on Thursday mornings at seven o'clock and at eight o'clock, usually around there. I put all my stuff back in my office and I take a walk. I go around uh, uh, the, the loop, I call it, which is up here to Windhorse, over to Sefner Valrico, down to Clay, and then back up Kingsway to the church. It's three miles, if you're wondering, three miles. And so I walk that almost every Thursday. On this particular Thursday, I don't know what got into me, I got all sassy, and I started running right there at the corner of our drive. And I, and, I, and I started, and does anybody do this? Well, maybe I'll run, you know, just a little bit, see how it goes. And I felt great. And I ran past the gas station, and I turned right on Windhorst. I got all the way to that corner. I was going good. I was like, man, I'm going to do this whole thing. I'm going to go three miles today running, right? But I got to the corner of Windhorst and Sefner Valrico. Does anybody know there's just this little slight bump there? And I started trudging up that hill. And it start, it's like these, you know, remember the cartoon characters, the demon on the one side and the angel? They appeared on my shoulder, right? And the angel's like, good for you, Mark. Good for you, Mark. You're so fat, you need to run. And, and uh, <laughs> my angel's very, very uh, direct. And, and, but on, on my other shoulder was this demon. It's like, Mark, what are you doing? You're so fat. Stop running, right? <laughs> So they duked it out as I'm running up this little hill. And my goal ceased being getting back to this church. I was just trying to get to that Chevy. Are you with me? And I just made these mini goals along the way. And I'm proud of this. I made it all the way to the corner of Clay and Sefner Valrico. But I will testify that was it. Why? My body, my mind had had enough. I wasn't listening to this guy anymore. In fact, he had disappeared, right? And I was totally like with this guy. It's like, you're absolutely right. I'm too fat to be doing this. This is crazy. And I stopped running. Which is what Elijah does. And that's what all of us do when the positive or the possible is erased and the negative is all that's left. Hey, you want to make a mess of your life? When you find a low Try to fix it yourself. Separate yourself from anybody who could be a positive sounding for And by all means, please, focus on the whole and not the donut. Now the story is going to turn because thankfully, anybody grateful for this? God reaches out to us in our low moments. Is anybody grateful for this? I said, is anybody grateful for this? Okay, good. All of you are. I'm glad. I was hoping all of you would be because it's an amazing thing that when we are running the furthest and hardest from our God, he's right there, ready to minister to us and to head us, even in gentle ways, back to himself. Anybody want to learn how to make the most of your lows? Okay, I'll say it to you then. Thank you. Here it comes. How to make the most of life's lows. The first thing is this, rest and refuel. You're like, really? Yeah. That's exactly what happens in the story of Elijah. Uh, If I was God... I'd get Elijah to the broom tree and I'd just start going off on him. Are you serious? Where where have you been for the last three and a half years where I haven't taken care of you? Seriously? This is what we're going to do. You're going to run 100 miles away from me and the protection I could give you thinking I can't? That's what I'd do if I was God and that's why you're all glad that I'm not him, right? But This is what God does. He lets him sleep. Look what it says in verse 5. It says he lays down. And he sleeps under the broom tree. And and God says an angel, all right? And the angel touches him, doesn't kick him. (laughs) Touches him, and he says to him, God's gonna ream you out now, all right? Get up and get ready. No, he just says, get up, buddy. Why? So that you can eat. And look what happens next. He looks, Elijah wakes up, he looks, and behold, God has provided a head at his head, a cake of bread baked on hot stones. I'm picturing cornbread. You picture what you want, but it's almost lunch, and I would prefer honey cornbread. But it's cornbread, and we're not talking like a little pan. It's not like a little, you know, individually wrapped, you know, cornbread. This is like one of those things that you would challenge someone to eat at a restaurant, and they'd get it free. Are you with me, right? It's this massive, more than enough cornbread. And it's sitting there, not next to a little Zephyr Hills bottle, but next to all the water that this guy could need or drink. And this is how God cares for his prophet who was running away from him. Look what it says. He ate and he drank, and then what'd he do? He got ready for the reaming, right? No. He ate and he drank, and he went back to sleep. What a great day, right? Nap, 
food, nap. Wow, who's in? Every man in here should be, right? Ladies, you can putter around. We're sleeping and eating, right? And after this second nap, the angel of the Lord comes to him a second time and touches him. And this must be when he's going to get yelled at. No, what's he say? Hey, buddy, there's still more to go. So I need you to get up, and I need you to eat even more of the cornbread and drink the water. Why? Because the journey that's ahead of you is too great if you don't do this. I love that this is how it starts. Because a lot of times we want to spiritualize everything. You know one of the most spiritual things you could do? Stop. Rest. It's why, it's why God creates in six days and takes a rest on the seventh. Everybody knows that God does not get tired, right? He's not a tired guy at God on seventh day and he needs a rest. He's modeling for his creation. This is the rhythm that you live by. You work, you rest. If you don't rest, the work gets harder and eventually you say, that's enough. You gotta rest. You gotta refuel. It's how he created us. It's why he commanded a Sabbath. It wasn't just so that we could keep him holy. We should, absolutely. Put God in the, in the first spot in your life. Keep him holy, right? But don't miss the point of the rest and so that you can bear under the things, the lows that inevitably come in life. My experience, this is extra. But well, my experience in the church is that there's 20% of the people who are working too hard and never find Sabbath, and there's 80% of the people who are always on Sabbath. Talk amongst yourselves. But what should happen is that all of us do our part and all of us receive our rest. So that all of us have what we need from God in the rhythm that he's prescribed for us. So it starts with rest and refueling. But then very uh, quickly, we get to the, the crux of what it is to make the most of a low in life. You run to the Father. We just sang it. We, we run to the Father. And, and so, uh, you know, Elijah eats the rest of the food, gets ready for the journey. Guess where the journey is going to lead him? Back to God. Look at it says in verse 8. He arose and he ate and he drank, just like the angel told him to. And he went in the strength of that food. Here we go. 40 days and nights. That's quite a journey. Uh, he ends up at a place called Horeb, the Mount of God. You've read about it in your Bibles before, but maybe you don't remember it being there. In Exodus chapter three, this guy Moses is just kind of minding his own business watching his father-in-law's sheep, and a bush near him catches fire. And the voice of the one true God comes out of it, and he tells Moses to go into Egypt and to tell the Pharaoh that it's time for the Israelites to be set free. And Moses says no. Huh. But eventually he goes, and it's there on that mount, Mount Horeb that the whole story of the Exodus begins. Uh, God eventually, uh, after 10 plagues, emancipates Israel from Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They head back into this region, and guess where they end up? Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And guess what God gives to Moses there? There's 10 of them, the commandments. And so it's on this mountain, 200 miles from Beersheba to the south, that God directs Moses to meet him over these 40 days. You know this, but let me remind you. Sin, since the garden, has made us run from God. When sin entered the world, shame came with it, and, when sin, and, and self. And when sin came, uh, we decided in our shame and in our own self-abilities to head away from God and provide for what we need. So sin always makes us go away from God, and God has always prescribed, come to me in the lows of your life. That's what he does with Elijah. It's almost uh, uh, as if uh, he's, he's trying to get us to do what the psalmist wrote about in Psalm 46, to remember that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. He's our source. If you're a senior, listen to me one more time. I, when I prayed for you to find your next church, that wasn't just a nice suggestion from your pastor, it's for your sake that I tell you to find your next spiritual home. Run to your father, whether it's in Gainesville or Tallahassee or you know, Fort Myers or where did everybody else go? I don't, or hey, if you're staying here, co college and career is a great group, am I right? It's a great group. You know, post up in there and keep growing in your faith, why? 
Because everything in your sin nature is going to call and tell you to run from the Father. So we run to him instead. Rest and refuel, re reconnect with God, run to the Father, and respond to his whispers. Resp you're like, what? Just keep reading. Here we go. Chapter uh, 19, verse 9 says this. There, at Horeb, Elijah comes to a cave. It's been 40 days. He hasn't eaten since 40 days ago. At least, not reported. And he gets there and he's worn out. And, and it's there that God doesn't send any more angels. He actually talks to him. God to man. And he puts this question to Elijah. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now when you read questions from God in the Bible, it's not because he doesn't know. God's omniscient. He knows exactly what Elijah's doing. He's seen the whole thing. He knows it better than Elijah does. So he's not asking for information. He's asking for the sake of the asked. He's going to give Elijah a chance to respond right. He knows he's not going to, but he's putting it out there anyway. And what Elijah does is the first Yelp review in all of history. He gives God zero stars. Here it comes. He says, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. All of these things are true. Has Elijah been jealous for God? Absolutely. Has Israel forsaken God, torn down his altars, killed his prophets? Yeah, if you're reading the story uh, in chapter 18, there was this guy, Obadiah, who worked for Ahab, and he had secretly rescued a hundred prophets of Yahweh and put them in a cave. Why? Because Jezebel was going around killing all the prophets. So Elijah's not lying, yet here comes his lie. Are you ready? What's he say? And I, even I only. He emphasizes it, me and only me. I'm the only one left who worships you. And they seek to take my life, to take it away. He's come 300 miles south on his own strength, with his own mindset, to get on the mountain of God and tell God how he's failed. And he lies. Is, is Elijah the only one who worships God in Israel? No, I just told you about the 100 prophets hiding in a cave somewhere. And at the end of the fight with the Baal prophets, all of Israel bowed before the one true God and ascribed their worship to him. I don't know if they all stayed. People have a way of not doing that. But, but at least there were some, right? But Elijah, he's just like what we used to sing on the playground when I was growing up as a kid. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat some worms, right? Anybody remember this song? Am I alone? Okay. It's interesting what God does. I gotta say it fast. He's, he does something that's, since I've read it, the first time, it's always fascinating. He's, he says to Elijah in verse 11, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. Um, Elijah doesn't. So from inside the cave, this is what Elijah watches. The Lord passes by and a great strong wind tears the mountains and breaks it into pieces uh, and to rocks before the Lord. God brings this great wind. So great, landslides. But what does it say? But God wasn't in that one. It goes on and it says he, he causes an earthquake. The wind uh, was followed by an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in that one. And after the earthquake came a fire, kind of like what had happened with the prophets of Baal. Big fire out of heaven. Fireball, great balls of fire. And the Lord was not in the fire. So amazing to me. Of course the Lord had caused those things. He's over nature. And he'd been causing these things in the story of Elijah since it started. The rain stopped. Ravens fed him. He raised a dead boy from the, from, from, you know, back to life. He, he fed them with flour and oil that never ran out. He's been you know, showing his power over things, but he chooses in this moment not to show himself even in these powerful things that he was doing. He wasn't in them. Instead, as it says in the next part of verse 12, after the fire, he came to Elijah in the sound of of a low whisper. You wanna handle your lows right? Start with some rest and refueling. And then run to the Father, and when you get to him, listen for his whispers. Respond when he whispers. Now, I've, I've, I've wrestled with why this is what God chose to do. You can go lots of different ways, but at least this is one of them. I, I think Elijah had kind of grown to expect the miraculous, right? 
That's what he had, you know, had in his relationship with God, just miracle after miracle after miracle. And he, like so many of us, can kind of come to God for what he can give. It's kind of an impersonal way of having a relationship with him, right? It's transactional. It's like some of you are going to go to lunch today and you're going to be served by a server, a, a woman or a man, and, and, and they're going to basically bring you things to your table and you're going to weigh whether you're going to give them the 15% or the 20% or if they really crushed it, maybe you're going to get super generous. But it's all going to be commensurate to their performance and that's the end of your relationship. And so many people come to God and that's how they treat them. He's their servant, their server. And I'll do for you if you do for me. And that's not how it should be. Jesus sassed the Jews for looking for miracles all the time. He's like, God's not about just giving you the miraculous. He wants to give you himself. And so it is that in Elijah's story, God doesn't involve himself with the miraculous. He just comes to him and he whispers. Don't you want to know what he said? Maybe it was something like uh, the writer of Psalm 46 closed his psalm out with. Maybe he said, be still and know that I am God. In that psalm, we get this assurance. Hey, I'll be exalted among the nations. It may not feel like it right now. You're in a low, but I win. I'll be exalted in all the earth. Stick with me. Yeah, you got a little dip right here, but in these moments, just be still. Know that I'm God. Trust me. You'll be glad to know we're out of time. But Elijah did. He got back on the proverbial saddle. And he continued in his work as a prophet for God. You can read the rest of it. It's there in your Bibles. And I'm so grateful that God reaches down into our lows and says, hey, man, we're not done. Let's go. If you want to make a mess of your lows, try to fix it yourself. Go it alone. Emphasize the negative. If you want to make the most of your lows, slow down, get the rest and refuel, and then run to your father. That's how we're going to close our service and respond to his whisper. Even as we sing this song, I pray God whispers his direction in your life in the low that you might be experiencing right now. Stand with us as we sing. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again. Uh, God, this is us. We're running to you uh, in this moment as we sing, but I pray it's our commitment um, that we would run to you when life brings its lows. Uh, help us not to make a mess. Help us to make the most. Uh, grant us that, I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.